Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 19, which deals with the gram-positive bacilli of medical importance. Chapter 20 uh, took us into a deep dive of the gram-negative bacilli. Uh, this chapter is going to focus on many of the gram-positive bacilli, things like the bacillus family, the clostridium family, which are both endospore producers, as well as some of our other famous uh, microorganisms, such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, Mycobacterium leprae, and uh, Carinibacterium diphtheriae. So we're going to get into a lot of familiar um, microorganisms in this particular chapter. And we're going to see a common theme with exotoxins. Uh, since these are gram-positives, a lot of these microbes are going to secrete and exotoxin as their primary virulence factor. And as we get into this, we're going to break down this gram-positive group into three general groups. We're going to talk about our endospore and non-endospore formers, and then we're also going to talk about the irregular group, ones that are either shaped uh, differently, meaning that they're pleomorphic or vary their shapes, and those that have unusual staining properties. We will talk about for instance, mycoplasma, uh, which lacks a cell wall altogether. So treatment with antibiotics, certain antibiotics, like the cell wall group, is, is absent because they lack that cell wall. So we are going to get in and we'll talk about uh, these three different groups. And we can organize this into a flow chart. And we can, again, organize the flow chart as our gram-positive rods, either our endospore formers, which are our aerobes or facultative anaerobes, those being the bacillus. We'll talk about bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, a uh, very prevalent disease right after 9-11 uh, when it was being uh, weaponized into a powder form and actually sent through the U.S. mail system as a uh, weapon of bioterrorism. Um, we will also talk about the obligate anaerobes, which cannot survive in the presence of oxygen, uh, those being clostridium. Uh, we'll talk about tetanus. We'll also talk about clostridium perfringens, which is gas gangrene and uh, grows in dead necrotic tissue uh, where there is a, a hypoxic condition and a lack of oxygen. On the other side, we'll talk about uh, the non-endospore formers, and we'll break these down into kind of the regular uh, non-endospore formers, and as we mentioned, kind of that other irregular category, things like Carinibacterium, which are pleomorphic, uh, Mycobacterium are acid fast. They have that waxy cell wall made of mycolic acid, and that, that actually causes them to grow incredibly slow uh, much slower, sometimes a generation time of almost 48 hours for one cell to divide into two. So incredibly slow growers. And then we'll also look very, very briefly at the uh, filamentous kind of branching cells, specifically nocardia, which is very similar to mycobacterium. They actually have uh, similar disease states as well. And nocardia actually produces a pneumonia that has uh, an appearance very similar to that of the lung conditions from mycobacterium. And again, this is like all of the other disease chapters, just a summary of Table 19.1 in your book, uh, an overview that's going to walk us through a lot of what we're going to get into today. So let's pop in first and start talking about the what an endospore is. Remember that an endospore is this dormant resistive form that's produced by some genera, and specifically we've talked about three, the bacillus, the clostridium, and the sporosarcina. And uh, a lot of these are, especially in the case of bacillus and clostridium, are organisms that are derived and find their habitat in the soil. These are, again, endospore formers, they're gram positives, uh, and their bacilli, their rod shape. That endospore, when they when they actually go in and they uh, sporulate and create the spores, they are resistant to just about every form of treatment from desiccation to heating to uh, the majority of chemicals. 
So they are really designed to shield and protect the microbes nucleic acid from destruction. Um, when we look back at chapter 11, which dealt with the uh, physical, chemical, and mechanical means of control, we saw that endospores are actually one of the most resistant forms of microbial life. Spores we can see can either be centrally located in some cases. You'll see the spore kind of here. You'll notice these chains of bacilli, and you can actually see this kind of white halo, which happens to be the spore. We can also see some spores that are terminally located, meaning that they're at the end of the cell, and it gives them this little kind of club-shaped appearance. Again, here's the vegetative cell, the actively growing cell, and then inside you'll see this little pink sphere or halo. That is our endospore. So 19.1, again, shows you a walkthrough of the organisms we're going to talk about and the particular body systems that they are impacting. So let's get in first and start talking about uh, the bacilli. And as an overall group, these are gram positive. They form endospores. And we're going to see that some are encapsulated. Uh, something like Bacillus anthracis, one of its primary virulence factors is that it has a capsule surrounding it. And remember, the biggest reason for the production of a capsule uh, is for the avoidance of phagocytosis by macrophages. Uh, these are aerobes, okay? So again, we mentioned from the initial slide, the bacillus are either aerobic or facultative anaerobes, and they can also produce antibiotics. This is one of the sources of naturally occurring antibiotics. We are going to talk about two major species, bacillus anthracis, causing anthrax, and uh, bacillus cereus, which is responsible for producing an enterotoxin uh, that's associated with a foodborne intoxication. So let's start first with Bacillus anthracis. These are, again, long bacilli, non-modal rods. They have centrally located spores uh, that develop under certain conditions. And their virulence factors, again, as we mentioned, are the capsule and exotoxins. And these exotoxins lead not only to fluid accumulation and swelling through edema, but also death to the cells. And we're actually going to get in and talk about three different forms uh, with different routes of transmission and different points of entry into the human body. So our three major types of anthrax are the cutaneous form, which is the one that um, we hear about, I, I want to say the least. Pulmonary is the one that we usually think of when we talk about anthrax. And then gastrointestinal. So let's start first with cutaneous. This is the oldest and most documented form of the three types of anthrax. And it was actually associated back uh, several hundred years ago from folks who were working in uh, animal processing plants and were handling the hides and the wool of animals. And it was actually known as uh, wool sorters disease originally before it became named anthrax. The cutaneous form is all about a uh, entry through the break in the skin. So it's a contact form of transmission. And one of the big symptoms that is produced is this kind of flat, scab-like looking uh, lesion on the skin known as an ashar. It's actually referred to as a black ashar. This is the least dangerous of the three forms of anthrax. The pulmonary form is acquired through an inhalation of those endospores. So when the organism is stressed out, it converts into that endospore state, and the spores can actually be aerosolized and inhaled through the respiratory passages. Um, it can also be picked up from soil as well. Remember that the bacillus and the clostridium's primary natural habitat 
is the soil. The gastrointestinal form is associated with ingesting the spores uh, through things like food products. And this is an incredibly rare form. However, it happens to be the most lethal. So we would actually say that Bacillus anthracis is a zoonotic disease. It's acquired from the contact of animals or animal products. The disease, again, since it uh, is creating a toxin, uh, can be both a toxemia, meaning that the toxin is circulating throughout the body, or if it's the actual bacterial cell itself, could be known as a septicemia. Again, two major virulence factors being the exotoxin and the capsule. There is several methods for control and treatment. One of the big ones is through antimicrobials, such as ciprofloxacin as a drug treatment. Um, Vaccination-wise, a lot of times only folks that are handling livestock are being vaccinated. We can also vaccinate the livestock themselves uh, by using a vaccination that includes live spores or even a portion of the toxin. And uh, the toxoid has also been given to folks who are in the military as well. Obviously, also in terms of control, it's, it's proper disposal of animal products, of deceased livestock. Uh, that is another big piece as well in terms of the control of this particular disease. Bacillus cereus is the second important uh, pathogenic member of this group. And as we mentioned, this is a soil uh, inhabitant. It produces a foodborne intoxication through the production of entero or digestive toxins. And it is associated with food products like cooked rice, potatoes, meat dishes that are left at room temperature. And this allows the organism to be able to colonize and grow in that food. And as it does so, it produces endospores that are able to survive things like reheating. When the individual ingests the food that contains the toxin, you're going to see the traditional uh, digestive symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, cramping, and diarrhea. And it's usually a self limiting. Uh, disease state lasting about 24 hours in time. And there is no documented treatment at this time for it. Now, moving into the probably the biggest genera of bacteria that we're going to talk about in this chapter are the Clostridium. Again, also gram positive, also able to form endospores. The difference between this and the Bacillus is these not only are anaerobic, but most of them have the location of this terminal spore. Uh, the spore is located at one end or one pole of the cell. They are able to cause a series of infections, from wound infections to tissue infection, infections, and we'll talk about Clostridium botulinum, which is responsible for a foodborne intoxication. We'll also see that um, organisms like uh, Clostridium perfringens, while it's a wound infection, can also uh, showcase a form that produces an enterotoxin as well. So let's start first with Clostridium perfringens and the disease, which is known as common name gas gangrene, or the scientific name myonecrosis. And again, with myonecrosis, we're talking about production of a gas in the muscles that causes necrosis or tissue death. This is one of the most frequent clostridial infections involving the soft tissues. And spores can be found in the soil uh, and even different regions of the human body. There are several factors that leave somebody predisposed to this infection, including things like surgical incisions, compound fractures, diabetic ulcers, and puncture wounds.
any place that we would have a high degree of cell death, lack of blood flow that would allow these organisms to get in and grow in the necrotic tissue. Several different virulence factors, including uh, the alpha toxin, which uh, is, is probably the most prevalent of the virulence factors. Collagenase, which is able to break down collagen, hyaluronidase, again, breaking out down the hyaluronic acid, both of these permitting spread between surrounding tissues. And then we have the DNA, which is able to destroy the host cell uh, DNA. The alpha toxin is a toxin that is able to destroy red blood cells. Again, it wants to get rid of the blood flow and have an environment that is unoxygenated. Uh, again, since these are anaerobic, they don't want to have any oxygen in the surrounding tissues. There is two forms of gas gangrene that have been identified. So we have anaerobic cellulitis, and this is where bacteria spread within damaged tissue that is necrotic. And when they do this, they produce not only toxins, but gas. And gas gangrene really involves the uh, accumulation of carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas that produce this swelling or bloating appearance. True myonecrosis is much, much more destructive, though. And this involves, again, the endospore uh, being produced, releasing virulence factors, and we get this fermentation of the muscle carbohydrates, which generates that gas and leads to tissue destruction. So think about it this way as kind of a never-ending cycle. As the bacteria get in, as they produce the gas, the gas leads to further tissue damage which further tissue damage creates the environmental conditions necessary for the uh, clostridium to continue to spread to other surrounding tissues. So we're going to talk about how do you treat these? Like, how do you stop this never-ending process? Like a, trying to stop a brush fire spreading through a, a dry wooded area. Well, most of the time, what we're going to see is the following. Um, it's going to require some debridement of diseased tissue. So getting in and actually surgically removing that dead tissue. Um, it is going to involve uh, another possibility is a hyperbaric oxygen uh, chamber. And what that hyperbaric oxygen chamber does is it forces oxygen into the tissues and when it forces oxygen into the tissues, it reduces the anaerobic conditions necessary for the clostridium to grow. We also have an antimicrobial side to it being the uh, treatment with antibiotics such as cephalosporins and penicillins. Tetanus, which is caused by uh, a second member of the clostridium family known as clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani is a habitant of, again, soil as well as dust. And it is responsible for a disease that is known as uh, lockjaw. And that's kind of the common name for it. It involves the uh, muscles and especially the muscles of the face. And that's really because the early impact of the disease starts in the area of the jaw. It is a very common resident of soil, but also the animal tracks, GI tracks of the animals. And it again involves endospores that are able to accidentally enter the body through uh, wounds or damage to the skin. Clostridium, so again, it's requiring an anaerobic environment for the cells to grow and release a toxin. And the toxin in this particular case is known as tetanospasmin. And we're going to get in and talk about tetanospasmin. Um, tetanospasmin actually happens to be the vaccination target for Clostridium tetani. Um, the tetanospasmin has a role in 
releasing, um, it, as the neurotoxins release, it's able to bind to and inhibit skeletal muscular contractions. And basically what happens from there is the muscles contract uncontrollably and you get this uh, paralysis of the respiratory muscles. You'll notice in this case here that you get the locked jaw from the impact of the muscles in the face, but you also get this curling or flexion of the arms and the arcing of the back due to those uh, uncontrollable muscle contractions um, since the, you know, the neurotransmitter is being blocked. And uh, again, we're talking about not being able to um, stop the muscle contraction from occurring. This is also common in neonates. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's seen in developing countries. It's common also amongst geriatric patients and IV drug users as well. So how do we treat it? How do we prevent it? Well, there is an antitoxin uh, therapy that's available, and it uses a what they call the TIG. Uh, it's the human tetanus immunoglobulin. And it is, again, one of the key features is, is it is able to cross the placenta. So if we are dealing with a neonatal form, we are able to treat with this antitoxin therapy. Um, it's all about stopping the toxin from spreading in the body. So we want to make sure that we use the antitoxin therapy. But in terms of treating the vegetative cells or the actively growing clostridium, we can use uh, antibiotics such as penicillin or tetracycline. And there actually is a vaccine that is available. However, a booster is needed um, every 10 years or so. so. We will talk about the uh, DTaP vaccination, uh, which treats, again, diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis, whooping cough. The next member of the Clostridium family that we will get into is Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is a, a causative agent of a condition known as pseudomembranous colitis, and it is a uh, very highly common intestinal disease, usually associated with the um, treatment with a broad spectrum antibiotic that depletes out the normal flora. Uh, of the intestine. This Clostridium difficile, which is usually present in very low numbers, is now able to grow to very high numbers, and in the process of doing so, produces enterotoxins that damage the intestines. This is very common in hospital settings, producing a, a characteristic form of diarrhea. Going back again to this here, where this C. diff is located in very low numbers, and then due to some antibiotic treatment, grows to very high numbers. This again is what we refer to as a super infection. So an organism that is typically not a pathogen due to some shifts in the balance of a body region is now able to grow up and cause an infection. So. A lot of times, uh, these infections come from an endogenous source. The Clostridium difficile infections are very much on the rise due to the fact that patients are using things like gastric acid inhibitors um, for different treatments. So how do we treat and prevent C. diff? Well, again, since it's causing that pseudomembranous colitis, we want to try to perform some susceptibility testing to determine the most uh, aggressive form for treating this without uh, using drugs that are broad spectrum and uh, depleting our normal flora. Since this is causing diarrhea, which is shedding not only water from the body, but also key electrolytes, we would need to have a fluid oral rehydration therapy to replace the water and the electrolytes. And severe infections can be treated with things like vancomycin, 
uh, as an antimicrobial source. So again, you'll notice healthy form of the intestine here, uh, and then we're dealing with one that has uh, some, some definite swelling and uh, inflammation. So let's get in and talk about food poisoning or the food intoxications associated with Clostridium. So one of the um, major forms is Clostridium botulinum, which is incredibly rare, but it's probably more severe of the two. And it's usually associated with uh, folks who can their foods at home. So they do a lot of home canning. Clostridium perfringens, which we talked about a little while ago, that's our causative agent of gas gangrene or myonecrosis, is also able to cause a mild intestinal illness. Um, however, it's the second most common form of food poisoning worldwide. Um, again, producing that enterotoxin that is having the uh, virulence for this particular form. So let's talk about botulism first. Again, it's all about inadequate food preservation during the canning process. The spore forming anaerobe is present on the food. If the temperature and pressure of the process that's creating the canning is not adequate, the spores will remain. They'll continue to germinate in the anaerobic conditions and allow for more growth. So you're basically ingesting. Uh, the food that contains not only the botulism organism, but the botulin toxin. And it is an incredibly potent toxin that's only produced under anaerobic conditions. So as this microbe is growing in the food source in that anaerobic environment, it is producing this botulin toxin, which is released. And the botulin toxin is actually a neurotoxin. And what the neurotoxin does is it binds to and prevents acetylcholine release from your motor neurons. And that acetylcholine is absolutely essential for a muscle contraction to occur. So oftentimes you get not only neuromuscular symptoms, but you're going to see things like blurred vision or difficulty swallowing as some side effects. There is a, a form of botulism which is known as infant botulism, and it results in a flaccid paralysis condition, which is sometimes referred to as floppy baby. It is, uh, out of all of the forms of botulism, it is the most common type in the United States. About 80 to 100 cases are reported annually. And besides the fact of the uh, floppy baby or flaccid paralysis, it can also cause respiratory complications. Um, the spores actually germinate in the intestinal tract um, of the infant. And then lastly, we have wound botulism, which is resulting from endospores that are uh, getting into an open wound. And this uh, is common amongst folks who are uh, IV drug users. So how do we treat and prevent botulism? Well, we need to determine if the toxin is present in the food. And this is difficult because if you look at, um, you know, let's imagine for a second, two canned items and we open the cans and we look directly at them. Uh, the food source is going to look identical. So just by looking at a food product, we can't tell if it's contaminated with botulism or not. Um, we would need to administer the antitoxin, and that would help uh, support the implications to the cardiac and respiratory systems. The infectious botulism can be treated with penicillin. And then obviously, practicing proper methods of food preparation and preservation, things like pasteurization, can help to uh, eliminate the uh, impacts or the diseases from botulism. The Clostridium 
gastroenteritis, again, we mentioned is an enterotoxin. The spores contaminate food that have not been cooked properly. Then the spores are going to multiply. And when consumed, the toxin gets produced in the intestine. And it causes things like abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea. But we said this particular form is self-limiting with patients recovering very rapidly, often within about 24 hours time frame. So again, just a little summary of some of the major members of the spore forming pathogen family. I recommend set yourself up a, a table like this, a little bit different. I would say put your species name, put your disease, and then we also want to talk about, um, for instance, how it's treated, but then also what are its key virulence factors, because that's really important, understanding if it's a toxin or a capsule. Uh, those are key elements that are going to help you as you study and prepare for the exams. So let's get in and start talking about the gram-positive non-endospore formers now. These stain uniformly. The most important forms that we're going to talk about are Listeria monocytogenes and uh, Erysipelothrix, uh, which is the second common one. So let's start off with Listeria. Listeria is a non-spore former, again, still gram-positive. Okay, this chapter is all about our gram positives. These are usually can be coccobacilli up to long kind of filamentous forms. They do have flagella, but lack capsules. And these are incredibly resistant to things like cold, heat, salt, and pH. So we're going to see that this is an organism that can actually impact things like deli meats that are often very high in salt and are refrigerated. The virulence factor, which is key to this, is their ability to um, survive and multiply within things like macrophages. The primary reservoir, since it's again a, a uh, foodborne, is either through soil or water and it can contaminate foods and grow in refrigeration. So things like dairy products, poultry, and meat are common uh, associated sources. You can obviously, through pasteurization, reduce the organisms that uh, would cause this disease. In immunocompromised patients, as well as the elderly and the very young children, this can cause uh, meningitis as a, uh, a particular side effect. Also septicemia, the bacteria can get in and start to circulate uh, throughout the body. It's also important to note that the cells of this bacteria can actually multiply within the cytoplasm of the host. Diagnosis, again, requires things like ELISA, which is going to look for antibiotic uh, antibody specificity, DNA analysis, and we can treat it through uh, antibiotics like ampicillin. Prevention, we mentioned the pasteurization or cooking process is going to destroy uh, these organisms. They don't form spores, so they're going to be a lot easier to eliminate through the pasteurization or cooking process. Uh, Erysipelothrix is also gram positive, distributed in uh, many animals in the environment. The primary reservoir of this is actually in the tonsils of healthy pigs. We acquire it through abrasions to our skin, and it multiplies to produce something known as erysipeloid. And erysipeloid is from abrasions on the skin, and it is acquired from infected swine. So again, we're talking about pigs in this particular case. Penicillin or erythromycin are the likely treatments. There is also a vaccination that exists for livestock 
uh, the pigs to prevent them from harboring this uh, infectious agent. We're also going to talk about our third and final category, which happens to be the uh, non endospore forming but irregular microorganisms. And we call them irregular because they are pleomorphic or able to vary their shapes. So we're going to talk about five major genera in this category. Carinibacterium, Propionibacterium acnes. Uh, Propionibacterium acnes is one that uh, we see quite frequently. It's actually a normal flora of the sebaceous glands of the skin. Mycobacterium, we'll talk about uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, Mycobacterium leprae, and then we'll talk about some other uh, less known forms, things like um, Mycobacterium anerum, uh, Mycobacteria avium, and then we'll talk about the Actinomyces and Nocardia. So let's start first with Carinibacterium diphtheriae which causes a disease known as C. diff. This is a um, incredibly unfortunate disease in that it is common in children. Um, it's also seen in cases where there are crowded, unsanitary conditions. These rods are sometimes curved and can be pleomorphic, and the reservoir is usually healthy carriers. So this is able to be spread via respiratory droplets from the carriers or even infected individuals. You'll notice down here that we have some of these kind of curve-shaped, uh, slender kind of filamentous rods. So we have kind of two different stages to the disease. The first major uh, symptom that we see is what we call the pseudomembrane. And the pseudomembrane is this kind of exudate that forms on the tonsils and also the surface of the throat. And it's a inflammation that results in things like sore throat and even swollen lymph nodes. Well, the pseudomembrane can grow so thick that it can actually uh, suffocate or cause as asphyxiation. Also have the form that's produced by the uh, diphtherotoxin, and the diphtherotoxin is an AB toxin, and this AB toxin is able to become a toxemia and spread throughout the body, targeting things like the heart and the nerves. So it's really important to kind of talk further about the toxin. Let's get in uh, again. Here's our or exudate on the tongue and in the back of the throat, that pseudomembrane. Um, I want to mention with the toxin a few things before we go on. So first of all, we mentioned it's an AB toxin, and it demonstrates this selectivity to the tissues that it destroys. And the reason for that is, is because not all cells have the receptor for this toxin. So many of the tissues are not impacted or damaged. So you get this kind of irregular uh, tissue damage that occurs with the disease. The AB toxin is able to inhibit protein synthesis of the cells that it is impacting. So obviously, like we've seen with the other toxins, there is an antitoxin that can neutralize the effects of the uh, diphtherotoxin. So again, um, we mentioned the antitoxin, antimicrobial therapy such as penicillin or erythromycin are important as well. And this is uh, treated through uh, vaccinations. Again, like we saw earlier, the tetanus vaccine. This is in that same group. The DTaP, uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis are all given as a vaccination and require a booster about every 10 years or so. Um, Propionibacterium acnes, as we saw earlier, are either aerotolerant or anaerobic. They do not produce toxins. And we mentioned it's a, a common resident of the sebaceous glands of the skin, 
and results in acne. It can occasionally, in rare conditions, involve infections of not only the eye, but things like artificial joints as well. Now we move into the mycobacterium. Specifically, these are acid fast, and these particular organisms have a unique cell wall structure in that they have very little peptidoglycan. The majority of the component of their cell wall is a waxy lipid known as mycolic acid. This mycolic acid makes mycobacterium very difficult to stain and destain. So we usually utilize something known as acid fat staining, which is a type of differential staining. Um, also, because of that waxy lipid layer, it also makes these incredibly slow growers. They are strict aerobes, which makes sense based on their habitat in the body. They are looking to infect the lungs, and uh, the lungs are oxygenated environments. So they need to uh, produce things like catalase, the enzyme which just allows them to uh, detoxify oxygen radicals. And they're not very modal, they don't have flagella, and they don't produce endospores. Again, these are non-endospore formers. Very important, these are able to survive within your macrophages. So their key virulence factor is they survive within the macrophages. And what we're gonna see is the tubercle bacillus is this really long slender rod grows in masses or strands called cords and we're going to see that the cord factor that they produce prevents the destruction by those macrophages cord factor is really really important they don't produce any exotoxins or enzymes so basically it's the survival by things like the cord factor uh, that allow them to avoid destruction by lysosomes or macrophages. Lots and lots of predisposing factors to who gets this. Um, inadequate nutrition, immunocompromisation, poor access to medical care, damage to the lungs. It's estimated that about a third of the world population and 15 million in the U.S. carry the tubercle bacillus. Um, they are incredibly resistant and obviously transmitted via airborne respiratory droplets. They do produce what's known as a delayed type cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction. And really, what that is when we talk about a hypersensitivity reaction, this is an allergic immune reaction that occurs because when the organism is in the body, it recruits lymphocytes to the site of the infection and creates this kind of immune reaction or hypersensitivity that occurs. About 5 to 10% of infected people will actually develop the clinical disease. If untreated, it will progress very slowly. And what happens is those lung infections can actually disseminate to other organs in the body. We call this extra pulmonary or disseminated tuberculosis. So the primary tuberculosis often occurs in the lungs and if left untreated can actually progress to this extra pulmonary tuberculosis form. The, we talk a lot about the tubercle, which is this kind of mass of the mycobacterium that stay kind of localized. Again, we talked about the um, hypersensitivity where you have these um, lymphocytes that are recruited to the site where the tubercle bacilli are, and you get this basically immune reaction that occurs. At the center of this tubercle, we get this necrotic or uh, uh, death to the cells. It's got a very low infectious dose, so it takes only about 10 cells to cause infection. 
And after about three to four weeks, that immune system attacks, forming those tubercles. And we get this central core with all the bacilli surrounded by the white blood cells, and we call those tubercles. If that tubercle becomes necrotic, it forms this caseous lesion that eventually calcifies. If the patient doesn't recover from the primary tuberculosis, the infection can reoccur. The tubercles, again, as we mentioned, can gradually drain into surrounding lung tissue, such as the bronchial, and the patient will then experience much more severe symptoms, violent coughing, bloody sputum, fever, weight loss, anorexia, and it has a high mortality rate, about 60% if left untreated. The extrapulmonary TB, if it does able to disseminate and spread, it's going to attack things like the lymph nodes, the kidneys, the long bones, and even the brain and the meninges. So what are some different ways for us to detect tuberculosis? Well, we have what's known as the tuberculin test, and this is an in vivo test. It's done in the body. Um, it is using a what we call a PPD or purified protein derivative that is injected underneath the surface of the skin and its results are read about 48 to 72 hours later where we look for the presence of this induration which is usually greater than 15 millimeters uh, and that's what demonstrates a positive uh, reaction to the PPD test and this basically implies that either you've been exposed to it prior or you may have an active infection. doesn't necessarily tell us if there is an active infection. tells us about the uh, exposure to it. The in vitro test can also be done, and this is basically a blood test that's performed. We can also take uh, chest x-rays to look for the tubercle, uh, the tubercle in the lung tissue. We can acid fast stain the sputum, and we call this the zeal Nielsen or acid fast stain. And we can obviously culture it, which takes a great deal of time because they're slow growers, and do some biochemical testing uh, to understand if it is TB or not. So here's our chest x ray looking for the tubercles in the lung tissue. So how do we prevent and manage TB? Well, it's, it's probably basically uh, 6 to 24 months of multiple drug therapy treatments. Many of the strains are resistant to different antibiotics. So one of the most common ones that we use is a drug called INH, or isoniazid, is the most of the, uh, the common agents for mycobacterium tuberculosis. There is a vaccine, which is known as the BCG vaccine, um, and it's been used primarily on, on animals. Um, it is an attenuated form of a strain, a related strain of mycobacterium known as mycobacterium bovis. Uh, second member of the mycobacterium family is mycobacterium leprae. And mycobacterium leprae can cause what's known as Hansen's disease. It is significant, significant because it's a strict parasite, and we can't culture this in the lab. Um, typically, we do a test known as the feather test to indicate uh, the disease. It is the slowest growing of all of the mycobacterium species that we know of. And Hansen's disease is often called leprosy. It's a kind of a two-part disease in which we get uh, these lesions that form on the skin that are lacking pain sensation. And then we also get a form known as the lipoma form, where we get these granulomas or folds that form and can be extremely disfiguring. It's endemic throughout the world. The 
mechanism of transmission is still widely speculated, and it's truly not highly virulent. Um, it's, it may even be associated with a specific genetic marker that leads to uh, increased susceptibility to the disease. The way this basically works is your macrophages, just like we saw with tuberculosis, are going to phagocytize the bacilli. And it's a very slow T cell response that may not kill the bacilli. So it may take about two to five years for the infection to incubate and will grow very slowly in the skin macrophages. We mentioned the two forms. We have this tuberculoid form, which results in these patches of uh, skin lesions with no pain sensitivity. And then we also have the lepromatous form that can actually be extremely disfiguring. So let's talk first about the tuberculoid form. It's the most superficial form. It has these asymmetrical, shallow skin lesions that have a loss of pain reception. And this is the form that has the fewest complications. It's actually much more easily treated than the other types of leprosy. The lepromatous form is the much more widespread and severe form. It produces these deep nodular infections that disfigure not only the face, but the extremities as well. So here is this lepromatous form that has caused damage to the hands in this particular patient. Um, we can also get these, these folds or uh, what's known as granulomas on the skin. So diagnosing it is really looking at symptoms. It's looking at the uh, microscopic uh, cells that are derived from the lesions. It's the symptoms, things like numbness in the hands and feet or cold and heat sensitivity loss. Um, and it may be looking for the acid fast bacilli in those skin lesions or things like nasal discharges. Treating it, it's a long time combination therapy, requires a very significant surveillance for a long period of time. And there is no definitive vaccine that's currently available. Uh, however, that one that we talked about with mycobacterium tuberculosis, the BCG, may have some protection against the leprosy bacillus. We're also going to talk about uh, some of the other forms of non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. First one I want to point out is mycobacterium avium. Uh, the mycobacterium avium complex has been associated with the soil, and it is known to actually cause systemic infections in AIDS patients. It's the third most common cause of death in AIDS patients. Myco, oh, mycobacterium kansasi uh, is responsible for um, pulmonary infections that resemble mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is non-communicable, so it's not uh, easily spread, and it is commonly seen in adult white males who are either suffering from emphysema or bronchitis. Some of the other forms, um, this top one here is relatively important, um, Mycobacterium marinum, which is a water inhabitant and is acquired from uh, lesions that develop after scraping on the swimming pool concrete. It's often sometimes referred to as fish tank granuloma. Uh, Mycobacterium scrolophysium uh, infects the cervical lymph nodes in children in the regions of the Great Lakes. And then lastly, Mycobacterium paratuberculosis is derived from raw cow milk and um, most people recover from this. Um, however, we see a, a high connection with folks with Crohn's disease. 
Lastly, we'll talk about the actinomycetes. Uh, the actinomycetes are filamentous rods, and they cause chronic infections of the skin and the soft tissues. Two of the major ones are acti actinomyces israeliae, which is responsible for the infection of the oral cavity or the intestines, causes a disease known as actinomycosis. And then we also have nocardia, and nocardi nocardia causes pneumonia. Um, most of the cases, however, are seen in patients that are immunocompromised. And the transmission is primarily through respiratory droplets, or the organism habitat-wise uh, primarily is found in the soil. So this causes this pulmonary disease very similar to what we see with tuberculosis. So with that said, that is the end of chapter 19. Feel free to stop in at office hours, ask any questions that you have, uh, definitely start to review and organize your notes again. As I've mentioned with the other disease chapters, a table that organizes your disease, your causative agent, your symptoms, and your treatments are, are are key and under the symptoms making sure that you note the virulence factors is a very important element as well have a fantastic week and i look forward to seeing everybody soon